Hey everybody, welcome to today's webinar. My name is Mark Shonagal, and what I'm gonna be showing you today is Softimage 2013's powerful new crowd simulation tool set called CrowdFX. Uh, CrowdFX is built entirely based on uh, Softimage ICE technology, which of course is our fully multi-threaded visual programming language found only inside Softimage. And uh, what we're gonna use that for is, like I mentioned, we're gonna be creating a, a bunch of cool little crowd simulations. Here's a very basic one that I set up just using a single character and a single uh, animation of our character waving just to wish us all a good morning to kick off the day. But things like this, scenes like this are actually very simple to set up now using crowd effects. Uh, we've gone ahead and added a few new little menu buttons here to the left side of our ICE, uh, of our ICE command panel. Uh, just to kind of get you started, of course, it is built through ICE, so all of this is uh, going to be creating nodes underneath, which, of course, we can edit and uh, take a look at later. So just going to stop the simulation, go ahead and get a new scene, and before we get rolling too much, just want to show you how easy it is to set up a simulation like that, just to get uh, just get our feet wet. So we'll start off by bringing in an actor, so I'm going to go into my ICE module here and just click on Crowd Effects, and under Actors, we're going to do a default pedestrian. If you're new to Softimage, I'm going to try to make this uh, this presentation for new users and also for advanced users alike. So uh, if you're brand new to Softimage, if you're using Softimage through the suites, that's great. I'm going to be showing you how we can import uh, animations from Motion Builder, how we can take our crowd simulation, uh, pipe that out into Max or Maya through FBX, and try to uh, try to explain the menu systems just a little bit more in detail for, uh, for those of you that are new. So uh, if by any chance your menu system doesn't say ice here on the left, just go ahead and click the word uh, model animate, whichever one is coming up here and put it on ice or just anywhere in the viewport, just press the number four key and this should snap into the ice uh, module. So again, uh, just like I did, hit uh, crowd effects, actor, and you wanna get a default pedestrian. The default pedestrian will load up. This is a, uh, a low resolution character that Softimage ships with. Uh, you can see it has a rig built underneath him. We can grab, say, a, a leg right here, rotate it, and you can see this is a very basic rig to a uh, hooked up to a, a very low resolution character. Generally, when you're dealing with crowds, you don't want to have large characters because you know they're going to be this this uh, this scale on your screen anyway, most likely. So instead of putting a lot of detail in there, which will just slow down the simulation, just try to keep your characters as lightweight as possible. So again, we ship with this nice uh, low resolution rig character. We also give you some animations uh, that you can mess around with just to get your uh, just to get your feet wet. I have a lot of wet feet today, apparently. Um, so yeah, I could go and say, you know, I want a standing idle pose, uh, a walking um, pose, and a running pose. And we call any animations that you bring into the system poses, which we'll look at uh, later in the demo. I'm just going to go ahead and import those as selected actions. Now, for a pedestrian crowd, uh, the default is going to use three actions. A pedestrian crowd is where you have characters walking around versus a stadium crowd where everybody's sort of standing and, and uh, doing different motions there. We'll take a look at both of those, of course. Uh, so anyway, just go ahead and load those in. Click on Apply Actions, and you can see the character will snap into the first frame of the three actions we imported. And uh, really, that's it. That loaded up the, the uh, animations onto the character, uh, ready to be... Uh, to be sent to the crowd effects tool set. Um, then from there, we just click on the simulation button and tell it what kind of a crowd we want. How about a, uh, a pedestrian crowd to start things off? So click pedestrian crowd. What it's now doing behind the scene is building uh, several different ice trees, several different uh, simulation settings to create this particle effect. Because really at the end of the day, the ice tool set or the, the crowd effects tool set is just an elaborate particle simulation. Each one of these characters is just attached to a particle. And if I press the play button, uh, which is actually simulate in this case, uh, which is actually big, big something to, uh, to realize, uh, we're not really playing back the animation right now. We're simulating it. Every one of these frames is simulating in real time. There's collision avoidance going on. We don't really see of any of that going on right now. Uh, but as we get a little deeper in the demo, you'll see that there's a lot of, uh, lot of stuff being simulated right on the fly. So we are actually simulating, not playing back right now. Uh, and there you go. You can see our character is walking forward. Um, just right off the bat, we get our emitter property page that pops up. I can uh, bump this up to say 100 characters if I want. And the next time we simulate it, you can see that we're now up to 100 characters. Uh, I mentioned the ice is fully multi-threaded, so uh, I'm actually on a four core laptop right now. So we're getting some pretty good performance out of that. If you had a, a 12 core or, or a new 16 core beast, this would be uh, quite a bit faster and you could uh, have quite a bit more characters, obviously. Uh, and that's really all dependent on RAM and CPU performance as to what, uh, what type of performance you're gonna get out of crowd effects. Anyway, uh, we can see really easily we've created those 100 characters, uh, but we did we did pick a, an idle cycle, a walk cycle, and a run cycle, but we're not really seeing the run. So what I'll do is uh, just click down here under simulation, and we've got these uh, these five little 
uh, window or these five little menu items here under edit. These will allow me to bring up various panels that allow us to control our, our character. So inspect emitter is going to bring up the one that we already had up here. I'm going to lock that in place. Click this little icon right here on your property page. We'll lock it in place uh, so that it doesn't get refreshed with new data. Uh, now I'll take a look at say maybe the collision avoidance and you can see we get another property page. I'll lock that guy in place. Uh, and now I'll do this one here, which is the one above it, the, uh, the initialized collision avoidance. And this is going to give me some, some parameters I can now adjust to, uh, to fine tune my crowd simulation. So first thing I want to do is just change the target speed. Right now we're only reaching a target speed of, uh, of 12. And in fact, let me load up one more property page, which is the animation page. And uh, you can see here, this tells us the, uh, the transition times and also the speed that's required to, to uh, pop into the next uh, type of animation. So right now the run cycle is uh, gonna be triggered once the speed gets up to 21, but our target speed is only 12. So if I bump the target speed up to say 25, we should now see our characters pop into a run cycle. Uh, I could increase this to like a thousand frames and there you go. So these guys will just keep on running. I could change the duration for the uh, for the length of time it takes them to go into that. I like a little bit longer transition, like so, uh, and there you go. Now I did mention this is all being driven through ICE, so I'm just going to close these menus really quick, and let's just pop into ICE. Uh, the easiest way to do that is to click this little button right down here in the bottom left. Uh, this will set your your three of, well actually select your four four windows into three windows. It'll put the ice tree at the bottom, your main viewport here in the top right, and your explorer over here to the left. Now, if we just take a little uh, move the camera a little bit there, we can see that the crowd simulation uh, when I use these menus here actually built a few things automatically for me. First, it brought in the crowd. I'm sorry. First, it brought in the pedestrian. The pedestrian is the character that that popped in right away where we loaded the animation sources on, and then when I went simulate pedestrian crowd it created this pedestrian model. Now under this pedestrian model is quite a lot of stuff and it really uh, really is important to take some time and really just go through these menus and figure out exactly what it is doing uh, when it creates the pedestrian crowd uh, and also the, uh, the crowd here. Under the crowd, uh, we have our simulation route. If we open this up, we have our point cloud and if we open this up, we can see all the different ice trees that crowd effects created for us. Uh, under the uh, under the pedestrian model, you're going to also see the mixer, and this is where we're going to see all of our animation sources. And I'll show you how we can load up some new animation sources in just a second. So uh, again, as we uh, as we built the crowd through the menu system here, what it did behind the scenes was it created these different ice attributes, these different ice trees for us. Uh, the one here in the bottom, this loads up our our uh, all of our animations. Uh, this one here is our emitter. This is where we can control. The emitting properties and you can see this property page here is the same property page that came up when i said inspect emitter so all we're really doing for for these here are just really double clicking in a sense on some of these nodes collision avoidance you might recognize that one that one's this guy right there same exact property page so again just a quick way uh, mostly for people who are unfamiliar with ice or who don't want to get their hands dirty with ice that you can bring up the same values same parameters to control your simulation they're here or for more advanced users, you can dive into the ice tree and you can see the uh, the property pages appear there. Um, so again, we have our emitter, we have the particle simulation. This is where we deal with goals. Um, also the target speed, we saw that menu up here. That's all here under the, uh, the particle simulation. The skeletal animation, this is where you might wanna go in. This is where we can see our different pose states. Uh, again, this is getting a little bit more advanced for some advanced users. Uh, each pose is basically your, your different um, animation cycles. So whether it be the, the first pose or the, the zero pose is the idle, pose one is the walk, and pose two is the run, and then what really triggers those different effects. And again, a lot of this stuff you can do just through the menu system here. More advanced users, dive into ice and, uh, and get your feet dirty there, or feet wet, whatever it is you want to do with them. Uh, and then the shape instancing, this is uh, what really glues the, uh, the characters to the particle simulation. Uh, we'll dive into that in depth depth later on as well. But uh, you can see that really just through a couple quick little mouse clicks, we're able to create a pretty cool looking crowd simulation. So they're not doing a whole lot right now. We haven't uh, messed with the emitters. We haven't had any goals. We haven't put up any walls or anything like that. We've just got a basic character animation cycle of uh, some characters walk to run and multiplied those by a couple hundred characters. So 
What we really wanna to do to start off though, before we really dive into the crowd tools, is take a look at the character setup, because that's really important. Uh, you're gonna to wanna to bring in your own characters. I wanna show you how you do that. There's a few little uh, caveats you have to look out for, but you can bring in a character from Max, you can bring in a character Maya, uh, anything, Poser, bring it in, either Gator it, which I'll show you how that works, which is a, which is a tool we have to attach your, your skin to an envelope, to a rig. Uh, just you know, bring in your, your default mesh, attach it to our rig. You can use your own skeletal system, your own rig, as long as it has animation on it, crowd effects should be able to use it. Uh, so really wanna show you some of those things before we uh, dive into actually controlling the crowd. So with that, I'm just gonna get a new scene and let's talk a little bit about character setup. So when dealing with crowd effects, character setup is obviously very important. Now we built these three new import buttons into the uh, crowd effects tool right here. Uh, import model, get from scene and default pedestrian. Uh, if we choose import model, it's going to go and bring up a prompter for, we, for us to pull off a, uh, a soft image model file off our hard drive. Uh, had we had a character preloaded in the scene, we could do a get from scene, uh, or we can choose default pedestrian. I'm going to go ahead and get default pedestrian again. Uh, and what's really important to point out here is these input methods, or import methods rather, are different than the import methods that we've all grown accustomed to within soft image. Uh, we have file import, and you can see we have all these different file types, uh, and we do have import model. But when you import a model using, you know, the old the old method, uh, it just brings the model into the scene and doesn't do much else to it. When you use the new uh, actor's import model from the crowd effects tool, it actually applies several ice attributes to the mesh and to the to the rig actually, uh, which is different than the than the standard import. It kind of sets it up for crowd effects. Uh, one thing it does is it assigns some ice attributes, as I mentioned. So if I select the geometry here uh, and take a look, you can see that these two ice trees have actually been assigned to the character. They were not saved with the character. They come in when you do this method here. Um, so it's really important to to make sure you, do, you have is these ice operators removed if you're going to use this guy uh, later on. So and all I mean by that is, so if, let's just say I go into shaded view. If I want to change this character's color, uh, if I go here to my materials, uh, click on my pedestrian library, click on the shirt, and let's just change this to say a purple shirt. Uh, if I were to export this right now and bring it back in, none of that would, would be reflective. It'd probably come in as gray or, or no materials at all. Uh, if you want that to work, you need to select these two ice attributes, delete them, uh, and then you can go ahead and do your export. So from here, I can say file, export, model, and oh, make sure your model selected, uh, branch select it. So middle click, make sure you get everything. File, export model, and I'll just call this uh, pedestrian dash, uh, pedestrian dash, if I can push the right key here, purple, there we go. And I'll just replace the existing one. So this guy is now A-OK -okay to then be used later. It'll reapply those, those objects or those ice elements to it. Uh, so that's just if you're using, you know, again, this standard guy right here. Uh, what I like to do, or just a quick little tip for those of you who aren't really familiar with Soft Image, if you really just quickly want to get your own character into Soft, uh, is just use this template here and bring in your geometry and just copy all the envelope weights over to your character uh, for you to use in crowd effects. So that's actually really easy to do. Uh, to kind of illustrate that, I'm going to use uh, a plugin actually called Species by our friends at Exocortex. Uh, what Species allows you to do is really create all sorts of cool characters just with a few simple controllers. Uh, you can use them for you know full-on animation. It, it creates a really powerful rig, uh, or I can, can show you how we can use it for crowd effects. So I'm just gonna go into my species pulldown, click on hominid, and um, click on build, and I wanna bring in a, a male character. So you can see that brought in a second character. Uh, really all I need to do is just adjust the shoulders, but before I do that, I wanna show you some of the cool things that uh, this character has in it. So I'm gonna select my pedestrian, just gonna hide him for a second, and let's just take a look at um, the species character by again from Exocortex. So brought in a character, I've got all these little controllers that I can that I can use. Now these aren't your rig controllers, these are actually your sculpting controllers for creating the character. Uh, with any one of these pressed uh, or selected, press F3, and that'll bring up what we call a synoptic view. Uh, this is something any user can create for any character, for any object, for any scene that they like. Uh, it's basically some bitmaps with some uh, hotspots over them that will allow you to do things like select various elements. Uh, it can trigger different panels. So here I can, you know, just this easily, I can tune different characters. Uh, here I can control the selectability. Like right now, the, the mesh is unselectable. Click selectability. Now I can select it. Uh, I need to get the arms 
uh, going straight across and bring this guy into a T pose just to make my enveloping a little bit easier. So I'm gonna switch the arms to, uh, to IKFK or from IK to FK, and I'm just gonna rotate those arms straight up so they more closely match the, uh, the rig that we have in the pedestrian. Uh, then what I'm gonna do is click on body type, and here I've got even more control over this character, so you know I can really just set this guy up how I want. And these custom sliders just control a few elements. Uh, if you grab some of these red, green, blue, um, different controllers here, you can see the red ones there I can scale. Uh, the blue ones, I'm able to transform and just really change the, the scaling and the, the, the way my character looks. Anyway, we'll just keep them like that. Maybe we'll make them a little bit uh, fatter, fat muscle, something like that. So this is our new character. We want to bring this into crowd effects and use this guy. So pretty easy to uh, to bind this to our existing character. Now you could have your own rig. This rig right here, uh, which I haven't actually built yet, will work just fine in species. In fact, let's just go ahead and build the species rig just to show you how that works. Uh, if we click commented, build, and I'm just going to click on proportional rig. Uh, it's asking me to pick something. So I'm going to pick the model in my uh, scene explorer. And this takes about 30 to 45 seconds to create the rig. So I'm just going to hit pause. And there we go. So uh, what we were before we're tuning was was the sculpting rig or, or the, the rig that allows you to define how your character looks. Uh, once that happens, select a, uh, select a controller, press F3, and you can see we have a bit of a different rig. Here I can actually go and start to move elements around. And this is a really powerful rig that these guys have created for us. And it's it's really nice because regardless of the, the scaling, the size, the proportions that you made, for your character, this guy will be. Uh, this guy has a really nice, really slick rig to him. Uh, I don't have a whole lot of animations on here. They did actually send me a few clips that work just fine with this rig. But I want to show you how you can use this with maybe your own, with your own mesh, uh, or I just take a, uh, you know, this mesh here and apply that to the default uh, pedestrian. So click on selectability, and that allows me to select the geometry. Uh, they made it unselectable, which is nice. And I'm actually going to just blow away all the, the great work that the guys did on their rig just so I have just the skin mesh itself. So inside the Scene Explorer, press the F key. That's going to frame the object that you have selected. In this case, I have the skin selected. So grab this, hold down the mouse button, and I'm just going to bring this all the way up to my top level scene root there. So now you can see I've got the skin living all by itself outside of, uh, outside of anything else. I'm going to press the Freeze button. That's going to essentially delete all the information, all the envelope weighting, everything off of that. So I have just a nice piece of fresh geometry. Uh, I can grab the two, uh, the two hominid, the animation rig, and essentially the creation rig. I'll press delete, get rid of those from my scene. And now I'm left with just the skin there. So I'm gonna branch select or middle click the pedestrian and unhide that pedestrian character. So now you can see I've got the two characters pretty much in the same global world space, like so. Uh, I might want to move this guy just a bit forward like that. And I'm going to show you a great little tool inside of Softimage that will allow us to easily transfer one character's rigging system to another one. So here you can see if I move you know, that foot, obviously our species character is not attached to that rig. So uh, the way you do that is super easy. We're just going to select the target rig in this, or the target mesh rather. Uh, in this case, it's the it's you know our character here. Uh, go into your property, and there's a menu item here called Gator, which is the Generalized Attribute Transfer Operator. Select that guy. Now just select anywhere on the low resolution mesh. Right click, and it's going to bring up this dialog box, which will allow me to easily transfer the envelope weights, the shape animation. Watch this. Click just click transfer, and within seconds your new character, and again, this could be from Species, this could be a character you brought in from, you know, anything from Poser, Maya, Max, whatever. However you've built your character, as long as you can get that mesh in here, set the proportions up to match this guy here, and you can easily transfer that. Uh, or you can manually, manually rig it yourself, of course. Uh, I'm just gonna try and show you a little shortcut for, uh, for some of you that may not know all the, the uh, enveloping tools inside Softimage. Uh, from there, I wanna delete the old guy. I don't want, the, I don't want the, the, the low res guy even in my scene anymore, so I'm just gonna click on Delete, that gets rid of them, and now our new species character is nicely rigged up to the uh, to the rig that ships with the um, with the crowd effects, which has all that animation already on there for you. So you know, again, if I go into my pedestrian, all of those animation sources are right here waiting for me to use in crowd effects. So I could export this, and it would work nicely. 
I do want to make a couple changes uh, just to kind of make this a little bit better. One, uh, a little too, few too many polygons on here. You really won't, don't want this level of detail on a, on a crowd character. You'd probably want this maybe for a hero character. So I'm going to press the one key, which will change me into the modeling um, tool panel here or my modeling module, if you will. So you can see we have these different ones here. I'm just gonna click on modeling and we're gonna uh, click on modify poly mesh with the mesh selected. Gonna go all the way to the bottom and turn on polygon reduction. Uh, for those of you that haven't used polygon reduction in Softimage, it's extremely powerful. Uh, it's probably the, the most powerful tool or the pow most powerful polygon reduction tools there are out there. Uh, I'm gonna create, well here, actually before I do that, let me just bump up the level of reduction. And you can see here we're really going more for triangles. If you slide this guy, the preserve quad lines all the way to the right, you get a nice quad line preservation. So uh, look at that, We let's go here to final vertex count and just see where we're at. So we're at 2100 uh, vertices up from 10,000. So you can see we're really able to decimate this guy nicely and preserve the shape, preserve the envelope, everything's good there. And so maybe the last thing we'll do is just go ahead and assign a material to them. So uh, I'm just going to go ahead and select all those polygons, go to material, Lambert. Now, because we're all using crowd effects, uh, it's important to put your materials on the cluster, not actually on the object. Um, so there you go. I've assigned all those clusters that to material. And maybe I'll select these, these polygons here and uh, we'll assign a new material to that. So material Lambert, click on no. That's gonna create a new cluster there, which I can then make like this. And check it out, we've got kind of a, a Hulk-like character, something like, well, I could've done a better job with his materials, but there you go. Now what's nice here is this character is ready to be, uh, to be exported. So I'm gonna grab this, drop it under my pedestrian model, like so, and uh, just middle click on this guy, say file, export model, and we're just gonna overwrite our existing Hulk that I created a little while ago, click yes. And now we've got a brand new character that's using the same rig, the same animation sources and everything as our, uh, as our other character did, the, the default pedestrian. Now the reason I did that isn't because the exocortex species rig couldn't be used in crowd effects. In fact, it absolutely could be. Uh, I was just wanted to show you a workflow of binding a skin that maybe didn't come from from species that you may have created yourself to the existing rig. So had I used the uh, the actually existing species rig, uh, we can load up this here. I actually have a version of this character uh, all set up using the species rig that does in fact have animation on it that we could use with crowd effects. So we could go into ice, crowd, and this time I wanna get from the scene, select the geometry, now it's going to apply those ice attributes to this character. Uh, again, this is using the uh, the species rig, not the not the included rig, and we're gonna, gonna get basically the same results. So here I have uh, some animations that were created specifically for this rig. Uh, walk, idle, so bring in the idle, bring in the walk, bring in the run, apply those, and there you go. So now these are attached, and I could easily now create a crowd uh, using this rig here. So. Any rig will work, absolutely. Uh, as long as you can bring it into soft, as long as your animation's there, you should be able to use it with crowd effects. Again, I was just showing you a workflow of attaching your skin to, uh, to, a, to a rig that, uh, that you don't have to build yourself. So anyway, there we have our, <laughs> our cool species character. So good stuff there. Uh, so one more thing I wanna show you with crowd setup before we continue is loading animation sources. So let's just go here and I'm gonna bring in uh, a model. Uh, let's go ahead and bring in this knight character, which we're gonna use. And notice I use the import model from here, not, uh, not the get actor. Gonna press A to frame all, shade this guy up, uh, press the eight key, and that's gonna bring up the floating scene explorer. And I'm just gonna dive into this a little bit. Uh, now remember, each character has a bunch of animations that, that come with it uh, if you're using the default pedestrian. I actually went through the same workflow of attaching this night skin to the default pedestrian's rig as I just showed you. Uh, a little bit of gatoring, a little bit of cleanup and uh, cleanup with the with the enveloping. If you do have some envelope issues, by the way, uh, select the mesh, press the W key. This is gonna bring up your envelope editor. Uh, if you press on this key here, uh, you can select the individual uh, effectors you wanna paint. You can press the D key. That'll let you select a bone and then you can just paint that bone weight. Uh, anyway, read a little bit up on, on enveloping if you if you got a character that didn't quite envelope right. But uh, anyway, getting back to what uh, I wanted to show you with this guy was animation sources. So you know when we bring in the, the character from the, the crowd effects, that panel pops up and lists all your animation sources. Well, these are all the sources that are on this character. They're stored 
in the mixer as sources, animation, these are all the clips. Uh, these clips are just basically straight up FBX files. Because this character uses the standard motion builder rig, any motion builder animation should just plop right on there. So in fact, if I just go into motion builder, uh, I can go here and file, uh, open, it's like stand around, scratching, etc. That sounds good. Press OK, click open, and if I press play here in Motion Builder, we can see that animation. Now, of course, uh, we're not going to go too much into Motion Builder right now, but you know you can author all your animation in here if you want to. Great for motion capture. Of course, there's similar tools and stuff to Maj. Uh, a little bit more powerful ones here in Motion Builder, though, to really get your animation tweaked and tuned. Uh, once you're done with that, just save it, and it's going to save it as an FBX file, and that's just great. Uh, that's going to load right up. So back into Soft Image, all we need to do here is go File, Import, go down to FBX, and I'm just going to navigate to uh, where that's at. I've got a preset here for my folder. Uh, let's go into my Mail, Animations, and this is the same same exact file list we were looking at inside of uh, inside of Motion Builder. So we were looking at this one here, Stand Around, Scratching, etc. Click OK, and this is the important thing right here. Import animation as action source. Make sure you do that. That's going to load the clip up. And now that actually didn't apply it to the character. You'll see it's not here in the list. It actually applies it to the scene root. Um, so if, you, if you'll notice right here, we now have a mixer. Before I did the import, this little node wasn't there. So expand this open, go to sources, go to animation, and there it is. Stand around, scratching, etc. Select it, hold down the mouse, and just drag and drop it right into animation. Now that's part of the list that'll appear. Um, so now if I want to re-export this guy, middle click on night, uh, so that's branch selected, go file, export, model. Uh, I'm just going to rename, overwrite the exact one that I had before. That's great. Let's get a new scene, close this up, and we'll now go into crowd effects, actors, import model, and I'm going to import the night just like we did before. So we, we exported it. Now I'm bringing it back in, assigning all the ice attributes and check it out. There's a standing around scratching, etc. animation. And if you want to see that actually apply to your character, just open up the night, go down through the mixer, sources, animation. There it is, stand around scratching, etc. Just select that clip or any clip on here. Uh, press the number two key to switch to the animation panel. And you're just going to want to do a uh, quick and easy action apply action and if we zoom out a bit i'm just using the scroll wheel there to zoom out uh, now i can press play and we can see the uh, the animation actually let me increase the frame range to a thousand frames just so we can see the entire thing press play and now we can actually <laughs> see him doing a little bit of a little scratch in there so all right, so that was all with character setup. So now I've shown you how you can bring your own character in, how you can attach a skin to it, how you can load your own unique animations from Motion Builder. Now let's take all of that that we learned and actually create some cool crowd effects. So let's just get a new scene and let's start. All right, so we got a new scene. Let's go here to our ice module. Uh, we're gonna import an actor. I won't use a default pedestrian. Let's go ahead and use the knight character that we just worked with. Load him back into the scene. And we're going to apply the stand, walk, and running clips. Uh, put those into the selected items, selected actions, apply those actions. And now those are loaded up into crowd effect as poses. Uh, and from here, let's just pop our viewport into shaded view up in the upper right. And let's go ahead and create our crowd. So just say simulation, pedestrian crowd. That's going to... Uh, you know, basically turn this into a crowd. Some of these procedures I'm going to do here uh, take a few seconds. So I'm just going to pause the video when I'm importing characters or, or whatever, just for time's sake. But you can see that's about how long it takes to do most of these operations. So not too bad. Uh, but there we go. So we've got our crowd. Go ahead and press simulate. And you can see we've got our characters now marching forward. Uh, I'm going to put this into loop mode right here, bottom right. Uh, press play. And this will just loop these 100 frames uh, over and over and over. So now I can start to do things like scale my emitter, maybe push my emitter over a little bit, lengthen it out. Uh, and you can see that you know I'm able to do this interactively, but the simulation only updates when it gets back to frame one. Uh, one thing that's really important to point out when you're working with your simulations, always have your frame counter parked at frame one. Uh, you can see what happens if, I, if I'm at frame one and I scale, say, the emitter, you can see that everything updates nice and smoothly. If I'm a few frames out, it's not going to update because it would have to run the entire simulation every time to get to that frame. So uh, just, you know, if you want to if you want to see that stuff happen immediately, just be parked at frame number one. So anyway, I'll uh, I'll redo that. Uh, repress play. Go ahead and hit control D with the emitter selected. That's going to duplicate it. Press V for translate. And now you can see I've got two emitters. 
And as soon as the simulation updates, there we go. You'll see both, uh, you know, the characters emitting from both uh, from both emitters, like so. So very easy to set this type of stuff up. Uh, let's go ahead and add some walls really quick. So we'll just say here, crowd, draw a wall. And wherever you start to draw the wall, it's going to draw it on the basically the ground level. So just click anywhere in the window, pull it forward, and you can see I can set this wall up to be whatever size I'd like. Uh, once you get it to the right dimensions, without releasing the mouse, hold down the shift key, and then you can adjust the scaling of that wall. And no real worries, you don't have to be too precise when you're drawing it. You can adjust all of that either with these sliders uh, or through your standard manipulators to, uh, to create the wall. In fact, if you hit control D, that's going to duplicate that wall. And that's now going to be added to the, uh, to the list of, uh, of obstacles or, or walls. Uh, anyway, so we'll make this guy something like that. And maybe just extend these out in the Z direction a little bit. Uh, so that when we add more characters later, they have a little bit more room to emit from, like so. All right, so we've added some walls. We've added, uh, created our emitter there. Let's go ahead and quickly create a ground. I'm going to press the G key. That's going to get rid of the uh, the grid right there, just to, to make it nice and clean. Uh, I'm going to go grab a cube, or a grid rather. I'm just going to scale that grid up. And we're going to make this into uh, basically a ground. I'm going to put this right at the end of the walls. Uh, go here to our... Um, press the number three to bring up your material module here and just click material Lambert and I'll assign a color to this and make this a little bit darker uh, maybe use some like a brown color for the for the terrain we could make it green but I'm gonna bring in that whole character a little later and then we don't see them so well so let's just make that green or that's a really bad brown but that's fine and you can see I can see my emitters they're kind of flickering there because they're both at zero 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 uh, on, on ground level so you could go here uh, back in your crowd effects menu and I'm just pressing one two three and four for those of you new users to toggle through these different menus uh, but I'm just gonna go here to my crowd menu and just say hide the emitter uh, I could hide the walls too but we'll keep those on for now but uh, there we go so let's make uh, a copy of this grid and I'll just move this forward in space like so. I'm gonna press the enter key. That's gonna bring up the properties for the grid. I'm gonna increase the subdivisions to like 40 by 40, make this a little bit denser. I may even scale this up a little bit. Uh, so I wanna make it so this is a nice terrain. So we're gonna put some some curves in here or some, some elevation changes rather. So with the curve selected, press the M key. That's gonna put you into move point mode. Uh, click on the proportional button right there. And then if you hold down the R key, that's gonna adjust the radius of your proportional brush. So you can see I'm able to adjust that like so. And now I can bring areas of this simu or this uh, simulation of this terrain kind of up like so, make it a little bit elevated, give some uh, topology changes there. And yeah, I'm gonna increase the frame counter here to say 500 so these characters walk for a bit longer. And now let's actually add this terrain. So with the terrain selected, it doesn't actually have to be selected. If it, well, here, I won't select it. Uh, with the terrain not selected, I'm just going to say crowd, add terrain. The mouse says pick. Just pick on the surface and whammo. Check that out. You got uh, a cool terrain with our characters moving over it. And just like anything with ice, it's all you know automatically updating in real time as I make uh, those changes like so. So we've added a terrain. Um, We've uh, we've added some walls. We've done a cool few cool things here, but we haven't really gone into the uh, into the ice module much. So let's uh, let's add a few more characters and dive into uh, into some of the ice trees and see what's really going on here. So you know they're all walking right now at a pretty slow pace. So first let's go in and modify their speed. Now I can do that a couple ways. One I can just open up the collision avoidance tab here, uh, and you can see I've got my my target speed parameter. Uh, or we can go into ice. So let's just do that and. If I select my simulation, my point cloud, you know, again, we've got all of our ice trees which are creating this effect. Uh, the second to bottom one, emit evenly from geometry. There's a couple, uh, well, there's a, a note here at the bottom, the initialize locomotion data. If I double click that, uh, we've got our two property pages open now that basically control the, uh, the speed at which our characters move. So this is the target speed. If I were to just type in a value of 25, you'll see the characters will now start to run. Uh, and this is where I can control the uh, the translation. You know what? How? What does it take for them to get to that? To, for them to switch into the different motions, the run speed requires a speed of 21. The target speed is now 25, so they're going to be able to achieve that. Uh, well, let's make an actual controller control the speed amount. So I'm going to go back here under particle simulation. Uh, this is where we're going to find this property page. So if you double click on the simulate collision avoidance, we're going to get this tab here. And essentially, what I want to do is drive the target speed with some sort of a, a controller that's in the UI. So let's go ahead and just create a cube. 
And this is where ice really becomes a lot of fun. So I'm just gonna bring this cube over here to where I can easily select it. And with our particle simulation active again, uh, I click on this node. Now, you may have noticed this is refreshing quite a bit. These little uh, handy buttons here are nice. If you click the lock icon, no longer will that refresh. Well, I, I unclicked it. So click on the lock icon. And now you can see as I step through the different, uh, the different ice trees, this ice tree down here doesn't re re refresh unless you click on the actual refresh button. So this is just a good way of locking to a certain view and allows you to continue to navigate for those uh, who are new to ice. So anyway, with this guy locked in place, uh, we've got our cube right here. Um, I'm gonna press F3. When you press F3 with an object selected in the viewport, it brings up this floating UI, which will allow you to easily drag any parameter off of that object into ice. So I could drop drop in the name, uh, but what I really want here is I wanna get the, the, the position in Y. So if I move this object, and you can see that the Y value is moving like this. So press F3. Uh, I'm going to dive into the kinematics, into the global transforms, and I'm going to grab the position in Y. Look, you just literally grab the letter, grab the parameter, drag it in, and now this node here represents this cube's Y position. So I'm just going to very simply have that drive the target speed. So now if I move this high up in Y, the characters move fast, and if I move it down low, the characters move slow or come to a stop. So pretty cool. So you can see it's really easy to add something like an external controller to really start to now program ICE to do something a little bit out of the box. Uh, maybe we could go here and, and add a little bit of variance to that. So if I type the word uh, RAND, it's going to filter everything for randomize. I'm going to get the randomize around value, and I'm just going to intercept that green line, which uh, which is a little uh, the value. So it's going to import the randomize node directly in like so make the connections for me. And now if I double click, uh, it's going to basically just give me a variance. So, you know, how much do you want to alter this value? So maybe I want to alter that by by 20. So now I'm going to have some characters that, you know, if I start this over, you know, some characters are slow, some characters are fast, but there's definitely characters moving. You can see that guy's moving faster than his neighbor there. Uh, and that's all just based on adding a little bit of variance to my um, to my controller there. So now we get a little bit you know a little bit more uniqueness, something to just make our crowd not seem quite so uh, quite so the same. So some cool stuff there. Uh, we can also make uh, kind of these little things that are called triggers, which are fun or testers. So let's make it so that if they're maybe in this area right here, they're walking slowly or they're walking at the controller's rate. But when they get over the terrain, they just go like gangbusters and, and start to run. So to do that, let's get a uh, an if statement and a tester. So I'm going to get the word if, and we'll just bring in the if statement. And you know, because ICE is a, a programming language, we can really easily set these conditions. We can get a condition if it's true, do one result. If it's false, do another result. So I'm going to pipe this into the the true value, and I'm going to pipe the true value overwrite the uh, the target speed. Oops, like so. All right, and now. This basically says, well, if the target, if it's true, which we haven't given the condition yet, so we're just going to manually click the condition on or off. Uh, if the condition is true, then we're going to use our speed controller. If the condition is false, we're going to use this value right there. And you can see that even though they're running and you click that off, they slowly go into their walk position. That's just one of the um, one of the values that you'll find uh, in the emitter node, but we can look at that later. Um, if I increase the value here, let's say set this to say 50. So now they're going to be at a speed of 50 unless this is condition is off. And then, of course, I'm going to use my speed controller. Well, I don't want to have to manually go into this scene and turn this condition on or off all the time. So let's go ahead and create some type of a trigger. So I'm going to do a test. So let's type the word test in here. And look, there's all these different testers that allow you to, to literally test various conditions in the scene. And they return a condition value, just like I said. An orange dot is a condition. Uh, so let's do this. Let's get the test inside null. And you can see it comes in as red because we haven't told it what null to test for yet. So let's go ahead and get a null. I'm going to press the Enter key to bring up the null's parameters. And I'll uh, change the null to a box, scale the box really big, uh, maybe even bigger than that. We'll make this like 100. And we're just going to position that here. So now the box is inside essentially our, uh, if we go full screen, you can see we've got the box essentially inside of our emitter area. So now with the box selected, again, just press F3 and just bring that null right into ICE. Plug this in like this into the, uh, into the name. So now it knows what name to use. You can see it turns orange. That means everything's good. And now I'm going to pipe that into the condition. So now it's, you know, it's pretty clear. If, the, if, the, uh, if these characters are inside the null, then do one thing, which is going to be use my speed controller here. And we'll make them you know, be almost completely slow like so, 
and maybe make them just walk just a little bit. But as soon as they leave that, as soon as they're outside that null, <laughs> look, there's some, there's a little escape, a little escape area on the side. So let's just scale that up just a little bit like so, and press play. They're walking all slow. See, those guys actually started outside the box, maybe increase the speed a little bit. But as soon as they get outside that box, they're going to start to all run like gangbusters. So, you know, really easily, you can you can create controllers, you can create different toggle spaces like this. Uh, all a lot of fun inside of uh, inside of ice here. So let's go ahead and add some more characters to uh, to this crowd. So that's actually really easy to do. Uh, I'm just going to press play or simulate, and let's go here to our actors. And uh, I'm going to bring in a new model. <clears throat> this time I'm going to bring in the uh, the blue knight. Click OK. So I pause it real quick, but up pops our uh, crowd effects panel, and uh, now I can tell it to import some new sources. But you can see here that they're you know they're not animating. The new guys that came in are basically in a T pose, uh, and the reason for that is they haven't had animations applied to them yet. So I can add these animations here, uh, or what you could do is go here. And uh, click on the inspect uh, initial anim anim animations and use this single animation sources button. Now, what that's going to do is basically share all of their animation sources. Uh, so no matter how many characters you bring, they're all going to use the same set of animations. So you don't have to keep reloading animations. And that works great unless you bring in a character that has a different rig. So let's go ahead and do that. Uh, actors, import model. And this time I'm going to bring in the uh, the character we looked at earlier that uh, we got from the species system from Exocortex. Now this has the full animation rig on it. This is using different a different hierarchy, a completely different rig structure, and it has different animations on it, of course. So this isn't going to work so well. In fact, when we re-simulate, it's going to do that. It's really just going <laughs> to spaz out. And the reason is it's trying to put the deformers from the other characters and the, the animations onto those onto something it just doesn't understand. So that's not a problem. Uh, we can easily have two different rigs, two different, you know, 10 different rigs, whatever. You just need to make sure that they have their own unique uh, animation on them. So I'm going to add these three, uh, the idle, walk, and run that are specifically designed for the species rig and let those apply. Okay, so close that up, press simulate, and you can see it's still still not right uh, because now we have to go back and tell it to not use, uh, to actually you know, use their own animation sources and not share animation. So now if I press simulate, hey, check it out. There's all of our dudes. Everybody's happy. We can make these guys go, obviously, faster with our little uh, controller here. Pick that up and watch those guys run. But now we got a bunch of T-Pose Blue Knights because, again, they're not sharing the animation. I haven't loaded any animation sources on them. So not a problem. We could uh, we could easily load those back on there. But actually what I'm going to do is, you know, now that I've showed you how you can have you know more than one different rig in the same crowd simulation, I'm actually just going to delete the, uh, the high-resolution species character and just go back here to our simulation tab and turn off or turn back on the use single animation sources. So that'll basically get everybody sharing their uh, their animation again. Now I did create that other Hulk character that had the same skeletal system that these guys are using uh, when we did the character setup portion at the beginning. So let's go ahead and load that guy up. And you can see now if I close this tab, we'll just keep the same animations, restart the simulation. Now I've got my Hulk characters, everybody's sharing the same animation and, uh, and all is good. Now, Maybe you don't want so many Hulk characters. Like, let's go ahead and, uh, and crank the number of characters up and tell it maybe we want 200 characters as opposed to 20. And uh, now we're going to have some people outside the walls as they were pushed out there. But, you know, that's an awful lot of uh, awful lot of Hulks. Maybe you only want one or two. So let me show you how you can control the filtering in the distribution of these characters. Let's set this back to 20 for now, just so it's a little bit uh, clearer. And let's dive into ICE again. Let me just close some of these property pages up. Zoom in a bit, and let's talk about how we can uh, how we can isolate some of these characters. I'm also going to go and just hide the walls. I uh, don't need to see the walls anymore. Um, it's fine, like so. All right, and let's take a look at the tree to where we can find out um, where we're uh, where those animations are. So under the emit evenly from geometry, let's go ahead and refresh that. We've got a node down here called randomize actor ID, and if I press simulate and pull that off. Resimulate. You can see now everybody is basically doing the same, the same, or it's the same character rather. So if you click, uh, if you double click on the this blue box here, the initialize locomotion data. Uh, if this is plugged in, you can see that value goes away. But as soon as I unplug it, now I can manually set the actor ID. 
So if we go back to frame one, remember it's always important to be at frame one if you wanna see your updates happen immediately. So there's actor ID zero, actor ID one, and actor ID two. So what I wanna do is essentially filter out or make it so maybe only one or two characters is gonna be actor ID number three. So we're gonna do a little bit of math for that, a little bit of a if statement, just like we did before. So I'm gonna get the if statement and I'm gonna plug that into the actor ID like so. And we're gonna give it a few conditions. We're gonna say, all right, well, you know, what is it that's gonna be true? Well, every single one of these characters, as I mentioned before, is a particle. That little blue dot is the particle. And every one of those particles has an ID. So I'm gonna get the particle ID, or essentially a character ID, and I'm gonna tell it that if you're this value, I want you to be a certain character. All right, so again, we're gonna use the if statement for that, and we're gonna have to get a little bit of data. So I'm gonna type in get data, and let's just pull that into ICE. Double click get data, click on explore, and now we need to find our simulation, which is under crowd, simulation, there's the point cloud. And when you open up the point cloud now, you'll see all of these different parameters that we're able to query, use, you know, modify, whatever through ICE. And the one that I'm really looking for here is the ID. So bring that in. This node here now represents specific particle IDs of the character. So I need to do a test. So the test that I wanna do is if the particle ID is equal to something. So I'm gonna type the word equal. So equal to, and let's just pipe that into here it's gonna return a condition. So that's gonna make the condition true or false. Now, what does the particle ID need to be equal to? And then what's it gonna do if it is equal to that? Well, let's say if the particle ID is equal to, uh, say zero or one, we're gonna get you know, these values here, which will change the character ID, right? So if it's true or false, be a specific character. Or use our randomized actor ID, just like we did before. So this is gonna ge generate random values, random characters. So if it's false, let's go ahead and just you know, make, make this a little bit clear. If the uh, if it's true or false, let's go ahead and just do this manually really quick so you can see. If it's true, all the characters are the same and they're gonna be this particle ID, whatever that particle ID might be. If it's false, we're gonna use our random actor ID like we did before. But the random actor ID is still delivering, you know, still creating these these characters for us, the uh, the Hulks. So let's go into that, and you can see there's a little bit of work here that creates those random values. Now, why don't we just use a random value node to begin with? Well, you want to make this procedural. You want to make it so that if you add ten characters, you're not always having to adjust the minimum and the maximum value for your randomized um, for your randomized node. So what we're doing here is we're actually getting, hey, tell me how many sources there are, one, two, three, do a little bit of math and generate those random numbers for you. So that way, if you add 10 characters, like I said, it's all gonna update automatically. So I could you know, just say, just generate a random value between one or two to get the correct night, but I wanna do this correctly. So what I'll do is get a subtraction node, subtract if I could spell, and we're just gonna drop that into here. So since I know that the, you know, there's three sources, uh, the third one is the Hulk. I'm just going to have it uh, subtract one. So now our randomized, I'm sorry, our randomized actor ID node is only going to generate random actors between zero and one. If the condition is true, if the point value equals something, how about uh, character number one, then you're going to be actor number three. That makes sense? So check it out. If I move this around, whatever I set the, the actor ID to be, the actor ID is three, which is this character right there. Hey, you're now gonna be a specific value. And again, just to be nice and clear, I like to uh, to do things like add an integer. Let's grab this value here, just so that anyone who opens this up can really clearly see what we're doing. Uh, so if the actor, if the point, if the character ID is one of these characters, you know, now I can see it's exact character number four. Hey, you're gonna be the green dude. Um, so there you go. So that's how you can easily, you know, kind of minimize or, or or filter out rather how many what you know what characters you're using um, so now we just have a bunch of orange and or red and blue knights and our our green hulk and of course we still have all of these guys here in the middle and all those are those are our initial characters so i'm gonna hide the hulk we can get rid of him hide the blue knight and uh hide the red knight well actually let's leave the red knight up for a second and we're almost done uh, i just want to show you a couple more quick things uh, one really important thing is constraints. So when I brought in the Red Knight originally, he had this sword. Now, this sword is uh, just a static piece of geometry. It's not attached to the character at all. Uh, I want to use a constraint to constrain it to one of these crowd characters. Now, if we inspect actor proxies, uh, take a look at, say, the Red Knight, and I can view the rig of that character. 
every single character that you create with crowd effects is going to create this underlying rig to drive the character. Each one of these green uh, squares here is basically a rotation, a deformer, that we can constrain something to. So there wasn't actually a compound inside of ice that we've created for you. But what I did is I went inside uh, some of the other scenes that we have, and there's, here I'm just gonna flip to that one here. We had this one uh, example, and, and really you should go into the XSI samples directory and look at all the examples that are in there. Uh, here's one called Marching um, Army or, or uh, Military Parade. And if I just frame up on this, on this flag right here, there is this little controller on here. And this controller is constraining the flag to the guy's waist. Um, so what I did is I exported this this um, this compound right there, just exported the compound, and now I'm able to use that in any other scene. So this was uh, just an unsupported compound. You can go in there and see what uh, what created this, create this from scratch if you want, but no need, I'm just going to use it. Uh, I just basically exported it, now I can reuse it. So with the sword selected, I'm going to use that, that compound. So I'm gonna refresh my ice tree. I'm going to say create an ice tree, and now I'm creating a tree on this actual sword. Uh, let's go into uh, my tools here called Mark's Tools. And there we have the uh, the constraint that I borrowed from that other scene. It's now in the system just as uh, any other any other compound would, would be. I'm going to plug that in. It's still turning red because it's asking me a couple questions. It's asking me, what is the point cloud name? Well, it's this point cloud right there, the one we've been using the whole time. So I'm just going to drag and drop that in like I showed you how to do earlier. We're going to plug this into the point cloud name. Hey, that works. And suddenly the sword kind of disappeared. Where'd the sword go? Well, the sword's actually now constrained to somebody. Uh, let's find out where it's at. It's actually right here. Ooh, kind of shoving the guy right there in the eye because right now it's attached to his head. So watch this. If we open this up, I can change the deformer index and all those green cubes it's now snapping to until I get to the one which is the hand, which is that guy right there. Now the range on this is only going from zero to 10. So if I type in like, I think there's about 25 deformers on there. But if you increase the value, now you can set the slider bar to just go between any any uh, deformer, any null that's on that rig. So now it's in his right hand, uh, deformer zero is his left hand. And once this is set up, I can just press control D, that just duplicated the sword and now move it to a different character. Now we've got a sword on character, this guy here and this guy right there. Uh, set this to what was it, nine for the other hand, bring this over, or I'm uh, sorry, it's more than that, it was like 20. And let's just find, there it is. So now it's in his hand. And if you press simulate, check it out, those characters are now holding those swords, uh, pause that a bit, like so, and they're constrained. Let's just frame up on that sword. So if we press play, you know, that sword's moving along nicely with the character. And obviously you could have as many of those as you wanted to, you could have shields. Uh, and the nice thing that they're constraints is you can release those constraints. You, know, you can do pretty much whatever you would do with a normal constraint, you can do with a nice constraint. So one last thing I wanna show you, I know we're really uh, kind of running out on time. I was planning on building a big stadium, but you can look at the new features tour to uh, to see how stadiums are built. But let's go ahead and just export our crowd out into, uh, into Maya. I wanna show you how we do that workflow and, uh, and then I think we'll be done with the webinar. So let's go back to our uh, emitter. And I'm just gonna increase the number here from say 20 actors to 200. Let's go back to frame one. And we might have a few guys that are outside the walls. Uh, that's fine, the walls are there. So just gonna put them on the other side of the walls. I don't really wanna retune this too much. So we have our one Hulk character. We've got a bunch of blue and red characters there. And I just wanna simply export this crowd as an FBX file. So it's very simple. Just go here to your crowd export crowd as FBX, and this is only going to export the crowd. It's not going to export any other uh, any other data, so I'm just going to type in crowd, press enter. I'm going to overwrite my existing one. Uh, just answer yes to all of these these uh, these questions in the dialog box. I'll let this export. All right, so I paused it there while it was exporting, but uh, now that's set. That's now an FBX file that's on our hard drive. So if I just fire up uh, Maya right here, I can just do file, import, and we're gonna import an FBX file. I've called it crowd, click on import. And if I zoom out, hey, there's my crowd. Uh, let's increase our frame counter to, was it 500 frames, something like that. Press play and check it out. There's our crowd. Now you can see that they're moving really fast. Uh, that's because now this is a, a, a fast playback almost. This is a cache simulation. Uh, it's no longer actually simulating it. I can scrub it. Uh, you could do the same thing in soft image actually. Let's go, uh, let's go back into soft for just a second. 
And if you wanna cache in Softimage, you can use the same FBX, you can import that FBX file as well, uh, or you can use this CrowdFX button, this, this guy right here. This will let you use the Softimage cache format, uh, a little faster, a little more control, but uh, you can experiment with that yourself. Uh, one thing to show you, you may have noticed in Maya, we didn't have our terrain, we just had our static mesh, because you know again, all we exported was the, uh, was the character sets. If you select any of the objects that you wanna export, of course we have the one click to Maya, so I can just say, hey, you know what? Send this to Maya and update the scene. I could do the same thing for Max. There we go. So if I press play, now you can see we've got our, um, our animation in there, we've got our terrain, all that stuff going on, and it's all a nice scrubbable effect. So anyway, I know it was a, a long afternoon so far, so I think we're just about to wrap up. I wanted to just quickly uh, show you a couple things on the web. First, give a shout out to the, the good guys at Exocortex. Uh, who created um, Species and a bunch of other great plugins for Softimage. So go to their website, check them out. Uh, also invite you, man, really take a look at the documentation for uh, for CrowdFX. There's all sorts of great information uh, about the setup. I know, you know it looked a little complicated today, but really if you just spend some time reading the docs, going through the menus, you can learn a lot. Uh, and lastly, on my YouTube channel, uh, M. Sean Eagle's YouTube channel, this webinar will be posted in a few days. Uh, I got this cool little uh, Intel logo that we were working on for uh, GDC and NAB. Guillaume, who did most of the development for Crowds, helped me out on this. And here we have like 10,000 actors forming the uh, the Intel logo. So, you know, here I was only dealing with a couple hundred characters, but again, it's all just dependent on your RAM, dependent on your machine. Uh, I can get about six or 7,000 characters actually with, uh, with just eight gigs of RAM on a quad core machine. So anyway, with that, uh, I want to thank you for joining and hopefully you'll use Crowds effects in the future to create some very cool effects. So again, thanks for uh, joining and we'll see you next time.